Well, welcome everyone. Um, my name's Andrew Stark. I'm uh, one of the co-producers of Walk, Listen, Create. Walk, Listen, Create became a social enterprise um, earlier this year, and um, we've been a, a community which has grown to about two people uh, who are involved and have taken part in various events and uh, participated or contributed things about walking. And um, we we began in July to start with a writing competition, and some of you uh, here have uh, contributed to that. And, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide a platform to encourage and support people who uh, uh, use walking as something in their the sort of catalyst their practice or something that encourages them to be as creative as possible, whether they're sound designers, artists, performers, composers and writers and uh, we're particularly um, uh, uh, wanting to develop uh, what we offer uh, around walking and writing and so this is a, a little bit of a trial uh, we're um, trialing three what we're calling walking writers salons in the autumn uh, once a month and um, Martin Howe has bravely accepted to be our pioneer writer he's actually uh, um, his first book uh, is the book uh, that we're going to be talking about a little bit, but we're actually going to be exploring more about uh, what brought Martin to, to write and his interest in walking and writing. Um, and the format is basically, uh, we'll, get, we'll get Martin to give us a little taste of what his uh, book is about and the adventures that he's got up to. Um, I'm going to then... Uh, uh, ask him some questions and invite him to uh, give us some answers about uh, the writing aspect of it. And then we're going to open it up to everyone uh, to ask questions. Now, there aren't many of us, so I think that we can probably do that without, you know, too much trouble in encouraging people to speak up, take your microphones off and, and ask a question. And as I say at the end, uh, we're going to do a little multiple choice quiz for you, uh, so, which is a sort of, uh, it's not too much of a test that, that you're listening to what we've been talking about, but there's uh, a couple of uh, prizes, um, which are e-books of Martin's, Martin's book, which have been uh, very generously given to us by Vertebrate Publishers. So uh, Martin Howe, Martin is uh, a walker, cyclist, adventurer. He's actually an IT technologist as well. He's going to tell us a little bit about that. His uh, first book um, is a fantastic read. Um, it's called Tales from the Big Trails. And um, I'm first off going to ask Martin to uh, tell us a little bit about what a trail, you know, what uh, defines the trails, the big trails. But what I'm going to also ask him is uh, to tell us a little bit of why he chose to do what he did. So. Martin, would you like to tell us uh, something about a trail, <laughs> the definition of a trail, and then how you came to walk them and why? Yeah, well, hello, everybody. Yes, um, Martin Howe. Um, I'm sort of uh, an IT technologist uh, during the day. Um, about 10 years ago, I gave up full-time employment and became a you know, freelance consultant. And primarily, the reason for doing that is to give me more time to walk. Um, my book uh, actually starts in the mid 70s when I went to Pembrokeshire with a friend aged 15, I think, something like that. And you know, with a pup tent and a paraffin stove and a tin of beans and some old army boots, we walked the Pembrokeshire Coast Path. And that's something I came back to much later. So part of the end of me finishing uh, full-time employment was making a conscious decision to go and do some more walking. And I re-walked the Pembrokeshire Coast Path. And as a result of that, that stimulated uh, you know, the idea to go on and walk and do some more. And then one became two, two became four. And before I knew it, I'd finished all 19 trails. And I kept many notes uh, about that. And uh, those notes became a book, and we'll come on to talk about that. But a trail, you know, just for, um, it, it's actually what would appear to be a very simple question or a simple answer is actually can be quite complex. But I originally set out to walk what they call the, the national trails, the UK national trails. And I suppose that national is a perspective of which nation you're from. 
but <clears throat> in the UK, the national trails are actually any trail that's government funded and maintained a uh, central government. In the England and Wales, they're managed by Natural England and they're called the National Trail. And in Scotland, um, there's a different organisation, but it's still the Scottish government and they fund something which is called Scotland's Great Trails and they maintain those. Um, and there's four in Scotland which are known as the long distance or the designated long distance routes. So together that's 19. And um, but it's continuing to expand. So I'm not a person who really is, you know, sort of a, a tick list, but it, it just seemed like a, a goal to start walking all of those. And those uh, notes I collected and photographs I collected in the early days, it was film photography uh, way before any social media or digital technologies. But um, some of the notes, in fact, were collected on postcards. And I used to buy a postcard each day and write some notes on it and send it back to my wife. And um, but I gathered those all together. They're all in a box, all little books, books about this sort of size. This is one I'm actually using at the moment uh, for some walking I'm doing. And I made a start to to write a book. And after a few years, that book became this. And I was delighted um, last year to find a publisher who had agreed to publish it. And it was launched on 2nd of September. And I've had a good response to it so far. So I'm very pleased about that. So, so Martin, I'm I'm kind of intrigued by when, when did the intention to write a book come in? Because you you know the, you you were keeping notes and observations and things like that, but when, when was it that you decided that you'd write a book and why did you think you wanted to write a book? Well, the notes originally were just you know something that I knew that I could go back to later on in life and read them and recollect. But actually, um, I was walking with somebody as you meet many people on these trails. They might be long trails, but they're quite small communities. And we were talking about reading, and I do a lot of reading, uh, particularly adventure books, so Nicholas Crane. Um, and we were talking about John Merrill, who wrote a book in the 70s, which was Turn Right at Land's End, about his journey uh, walking around the British coast. And I think he was the first person to do it. And it was, I just love those books, you know, even from the early days uh, in my pre-teens, I was reading Swallows and Amazons and, and the like. and he said uh, something to me that was, well, you should start writing because writing is an intense form of reading. And I thought about that because you have plenty of time whilst you're walking to think about these things. And um, I thought, OK, let's make a start. And, you know, I just created, first of all, I created a, a website and a blog and I started doing simple blogs about the site and I started to construct that. I didn't want it to be a guide, but you know, just to talk about my experience of walking the trail. And I thought, no, let's be serious about writing a book and just wrote four chapters and sent it out to some of my good friends, some of who work in the industry as copywriters and such like. They gave me some really good feedback and input. And uh, I took that on board. I was very open minded about it. This is all you know, left hemisphere stuff for me, uh, whereas I'm an IT guy, which is predominantly right hemisphere. But there was a certain logic to it. So I did plan. I divided the number of chapters by the number of days I walked. And that was roughly X thousand of words per day. So I gave it some sort of structure at the beginning and then started to work around that structure. That became 19 chapters. And then I put it down and then I went back through and I integrated it with putting poetry, which I'd found on the route, which was very inspirational, uh, any art or sculpture. And also I improved the, the dialogue that was in it, the encounters that I had with people, which I'd actually made notes about, and, but I turned that into uh, the, the the dialogue that I could recall. So, so when you began, though, when you started walking the trails, you weren't intending to write a book. When 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 did the writing no. of the book come in? Was it Trail Eleven or Trail Fifteen or was it? Uh... I think it was after after this. Um, the guy said to me, you know, it was a, and I thought I 
found when I started to write that I really enjoyed it. And I thought this is something that it's a skill that you learn, isn't it? And I thought, well, let's just put some effort into it. And, you know, it was very much, um, you know, if you have more time, you can write a shorter letter. So instead of it becoming just, yeah, I was trying to reduce the sentence length. I was trying to make it clearer. I was trying to make it flow. I was trying to take out the stupid stuff, really, and make it, you know, and, and also just focus on the unique things that I'd found on the trail, uh, maybe observations and descriptions of the landscape, and then and then make it a little bit more colourful by mixing it with dialogue, mixing it with descriptive, mixing it with the logistics of walking and the experience of walking when I get blisters, when I, you know, backpacks fallen apart, tents broken, these sorts of things, and just put that all together. So it was a little bit more colourful. It wasn't a journal, a diary of day one, day two, day three. I tried to get away from that. As much well, well as I think I think that's a, a key point, isn't it? Because I think many of us who start off, uh, we, we do keep journals and and we keep notes, and and then it is that tough way in which you know to make a book appealing uh, or to write a book you, you need to uh, convert those journals and and that's yes. interesting what you say but so w what have you learned through the writing that that you you know are about the, the walking if that does that make sense so you know have you have you learned more about the walking or through no, writing? i think it's i mean it's one of the it's a sort of confirmation bias isn't it in the sense that um i'm becoming more observant and, that's what I was thinking, yeah, I and i'm and i'm and i'm picking up on things which in the historically I wouldn't have noticed and so uh, it's not only just the writing but it's also photography as well so I walk past something which people might completely miss and I, it catches my eye and there's more things that catch my eye and I'm definitely far more observant when it comes to things like bird life or tidal conditions or weather or these sorts of things. So from that point of view, that ability to observe more is making my journal taking more interesting. And therefore, that's going back into the book in some ways. But it's also it's in it's increasing the quality of the walk, because whilst you're putting one foot in front of the other and you're sort of synchronizing heartbeat to breath to pace to landscape and when you get into that synchronization it becomes almost meditative and then when you're in that state then it's really interesting to sort of just see what what comes into your mind and that ability to observe you know, be more sharp in your observations i find that makes the walk really enjoyable and that's come through writing yeah and has and has the writing also helped you to uh, recollect what happened you know, where, where you were, where, you know, from from previous walks and where you had notes and and photographs. Did you then uh, find that by rewriting what you had written before or dra redrafting it in a different way, did that then make you recall more things about the walks that you'd actually made? Well, I think it's it's interesting. Yeah, there's a relationship between your ability to recall and the pace at which you absorb things. So, and I was reading some books about memory and the way in which short-term, long-term memory works. You know, when you go to sleep at night and you process that day's memory uh, through dreams, maybe that that process and puts them into your long-term memory. That walking seems to be exactly the right pace. So, I've done cycling and I can't recall as much about those journeys. There, uh, you know, I. And certainly if you're in a car or you're on a plane, so ask me to recall the details of a two week holiday in Greece from five years ago. I couldn't really tell you much about it. Ask me to recall a war in Yorkshire 10 years ago and I can remember a lot of detail. And I'm sure there's something to do with the way in which the, the mind processes and stores things from short term into long term memory. And the writing of notes and the writing, I think, is just reinforcing that. It does modify it slightly, but it does reinforce it. And yeah, the reading, the writing being an intense form of reading for me was about really, you know, starting to study and think about and reflect on. And that process of reflection also, you know, sort of encrusts the, the memory of the walks in, in my mind, not only in the book, but it improves uh, the experience for me as well. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it, Robert. It depends. Yeah. Yes. Oh well. Wow. Okay. Right. We're we're in. Robert's in. Martin, you're out of line. Yeah. You have to face you, do, you describe the book as the art object and the walking as the process. Do you see them as complementary in that sense? The outcome. Uh, yeah. No. I think that's probably right. Yes. I mean, it's 
the walking is the predominant thing. I think the the book is is a, is a pleasant sideline to it. But it's something that's completely new for me. It's, I've never written a book before. I'm a technology consultant. I'm used to doing business reports and things like this, um, which incidentally, it's improved my quality of communication in a business environment nowhere. But it, I'm just challenging myself to do something which I'm not built to do, so to speak. Um, you know, being a logical minded, process oriented person, um, art is something which I know I enjoy, music, visual arts, photography, but I've, I've sort of tried to force myself to, to work on it so that it improves, well, I'm, I'm improving myself and it's more balanced. I'm not just a you know, pure logical individual, but I've got a little bit more empathy um, with the landscape and environment. Does that, did that answer the question? Well, I found, I found it encouraging that you're using um, the, the book as a sort of um, uh, something tangible to come out of the process of walking. So, you, you know, you're edging towards wanting to make it something tangible. You know, the walking is a indefinable, it's an activity, isn't it? And But uh, a book is something tangible that you can share with people and they can read. And the, the, the two sort of complement each other. So it's, you're bringing it's sort of an art dimension into it in that sense. So it's not well, just what, what, what it is doing, um, which I'm really enjoying, is that it's opening doors. I'm meeting people um, in a world which I'm not familiar with. And we can talk about things about writing, about books, about walking, and the relationship between the two. And I find that very interesting. So if I had not written a book, those doors would, would not have opened. So you're sort of creating something in a way. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, Martin. Uh, well, thanks, Robert. That's great. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Uh, and anyone else who wants to pitch in at any time, please do. We were going to sort of say that I'd I'd chat with Martin for about ten or fifteen minutes and then open it up. But there's a small group of us, so uh, I'm sure Martin, are you happy to, uh, uh, to 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 answer questions coming from different angles? Well, what 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 I'm really intrigued by too is that you you've walked a huge number. Uh, you know, huge distances, and what's more, you've covered quite long distances each day uh, in doing it. And and so the practicalities for me about how you record and note take and things is quite interesting because uh, I I think I kind of worked out you're sort of averaging between about eighteen and twenty five miles a day when you've been walking, and uh, and that that's a good long distance. Uh, so do you just take you know three word notes, <laughs> or 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 do you do you at the end of the day you know, um, in, uh, set yourself a task. I'm going to, you know, record a journal for, you know, uh, for 20 minutes or something. What's what's the practical? Yeah, well, maybe on? one of the things that I don't feel I walk in terms of distance. I walk in terms of time. So time is more relevant to me. You know, so there's a routine of getting up at a certain time in the morning. It depends which mode I'm in. I might be wild camping. I might be camping normal campsites. I might be bed and breakfast modes. Are that some you know, mode I've used recently is to base myself in one location. I have a camper van and then take rail service, public services out to the beginning of the end of the walk. So the Thames path was all done by rail services and bus services. It's quite a good way of doing it. But it's it's about time. So there's a time, uh, actual walking time, there's traveling time. But really, a d there's a discipline at the end of the day to find a quiet time and to sit down and to try and recall things back. And so it's actually quite difficult because because what I'm interested in is capturing the things which were, uh, you know, sort of different. And at the moment, you know, I've walked the, the, the 19 national trails. I'm currently walking around the coast of England. So just on Saturday morning, uh, I left Sandwich in Kent to walk to Dover. And it was very early in the morning and a beautiful sunrise. But what I also noticed is that the contrails uh, in the sky were very, very short. And they looked like little chalk marks that somebody just scratched on a board. And that observation, I wanted to try and capture that. So when I write the journal at the end, which is only you know, a, a, a page or so, I, I, I don't do the routine, which I know my routine, but I'm just trying to capture all the things which are those observations of the day. And I'll, I'll write that and then I'll read back through it and I think, oh, I've missed something. So, for example, walking from Sandwich to Dover, I, I wrote my notes and I said, there's something that's missing. And what was missing is that there were the migrant watch people 
So there's people sitting on the cliffs, uh, the White Cliffs of Dover, with binoculars. And I stopped and spoke to them. And said, what are you doing? And not, not. I was also doing the same thing. So that contrast of you know, sort of official and, you know, I thought, oh, that's an interesting subject for the next book. So I made some notes about that just to trigger the memory when I come back to write. Oh, well, there you are. You've given us a hint for there, there is another book. You've really you've really got the bug. You've got the bug as a as a, a book writer. And obviously you have the bug as a walker. So, uh... yes, yeah, so I've got two, two books. I mean, I do a lot of cycling. So I've cycled around the North Sea following the east coast of England, Scotland, all the way up to Shetland, across to Norway, round southern parts of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, Netherlands, all the way back and then Dover and all the way home again. That was about 6,000 kilometres. And I've cycled from Land's End to John O'Groats, but not direct. I went, followed as closely as I could the Atlantic coast. So that included round Wales and across to Ireland, then the wild Atlantic way, and then the outer Hebrides all the way to the top two. That was about 4,000 kilometres, something like that. So I'm not sure which book I'm going to write next. It might be about cycling, um, but it's the walking, I think, for the reasons I gave earlier about the ability to recall. You know, cycling is more of a pleasure. You can take more cooking gear, the camps, the tents a bit more comfortable and you can take more clothing and stuff. But also the pace at which you move through the landscape, it's a different type of experience. And so that's why I've started walking the English coast. I've already walked the Welsh coast path, which is 870 miles. I did that two years ago, just before the pandemic struck. And I've got notes from that. And I was, you know, I looked conceptually either a book which is tales from the coastal trails, or I also want to walk the Scottish National Trail, which is not a national trail. This is why it gets complicated, but um, that goes from Kirk Yetong, although I would like to walk from Lindisfarne all the way up to Cape Wrath. And that's generally regarded as one of the toughest backpacking routes in this country. And then have a book which is the Triple Crown. So in the US, they have three walks known as the Triple Crown, which is the Appalachian, Continental and the Pacific Crest Trail. And I was thinking of a UK Triple Crown, which was English Coast Path, Welsh Coast Path and Scottish National Trail, and try to get that into a book. You know, trying to get it into 80,000, 90,000 words. words might be a challenge, but that was the idea to do that. I might just write it and then split it into two books. It depends. Well, 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 oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Robert. Sorry, yeah. I'm, jumping in. I'm interested in what you say about time in relation to walking, because you say time, it's not so much that you did 15 to uh, 18 to 25 miles, but the fact that that you were walking. So you see walking as the time taken to walk rather than literal time. If it's you. So it's almost a, a transcendence. So it's you're using time. It is. And I, I think there there are other things in the nature of the relationship between time and distance. And, and I'm going to explore that. I've read a few books about that, which I find just stunning, you know, very deep philosophical books of time. But um, I don't dwell on time because if, if you're walking across the Scottish moorland, then two miles can take you half a day. Um, whereas if I'm walking you know, on a coastal path, which is very good, I can quite easily walk you know, 30 mile days. Well, not easily walk, but a 30 mile day, day is possible. So it's very much to do with the terrain and the amount of ascent and descent. But I think what you were asking is really that you know, time and the passage of time and your perception of the passage of time is, is very much altered by what you're doing. And I think there's a relationship, as I mentioned, between cycling and walk. And uh, I think what you're asking of is, is quite interesting. And I've been exploring that. I haven't quite captured it in my mind at the moment, but that will certainly go into future books. Well, there's also something a little bit more that I'm interested in is, is a sense of timelessness. So in yeah. a sense, when you watched with, with Without time, without time, you're actually sort of becoming part of the mountains. You're becoming part of nature. So it, it's a sort of a um, not time-bound nature, but eternal nature. You're identifying with the yeah, uh, think, you know well, bigger sense. I'm interested that you know talking about time and the relationship with memory because it's you know time passes faster as you get older. I think we would agree. Um, but you know it's 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 got to do your perception of time has got something to do with your ability, the way in which you process memory. 
memory and the way in which you can recall and things like that. So you know, maybe you know, I'm extending time by doing this walking and doing this writing activity. And certainly I find the quality of, um, well, from a, my life in terms of working, you know, uh, spending time to go and do things, I find that, that that balance is perfect for me at the moment. But I'm very much interested in exploring the relationship between time and memory and your perception of that. And I think that those subjects will definitely go into my next book. Well, what, what I'm uh, kind of interested in too is um, how quickly you fall into a kind of flow or, or whatever. I mean, people often talk about uh, durational walking being very different from people who just go for, you know, two or three hours walk, uh, yeah. leisure activity. Here you're walking, you know, uh, uh, a, a long period from you know early in the morning till uh, late in the evening or, or at least early in the evening and then you do it again the next day and the next day and and the next day how quickly now before you start a trail what what's your sort of kind of how quickly do you get into the rhythm of walking a trail and and as as robert well, said sort of almost becoming part of the trail and part of the landscape well there's the, the physical aspect yeah so i do tend to suffer from blisters in the early days of a long trail and, and pain in my life really but I think I've managed to find solutions to that but somebody said that uh, well actually what I've experienced is that after about 10 days the walk becomes your life so and your you call it your normal life but what you were doing before that is gone and the routine of getting up walking um, also you become you know, adjusted and adapted to doing that each day and then that becomes your your flow if I can call it that and um, that becomes really pleasurable and there's certain points in my walking where uh, that flow um, becomes you know really joyful and there's many times when I've been on the top of a mountain ridge or on a coastal path in the late evening I'm exhausted um, but the, uh, the the joyfulness that you get having you know that repetition that med it's almost like you I'm not saying you've reached nirvana but that the, the, you've been meditating all day because you've got into the really good state steady state walking and you, you, you it becomes really joyful at the end of the day particularly after you've done it for a long period of time so I think I've walked up to four to five weeks at stages and, and have you found the same while you're writing that's what I'm interested in is well find... yes I mean um, I'm sure most writers would recognize that, that they look at the clock and it's three o'clock in the morning and that that has happened to me I just get into that and I do get stuck and I just put it down and come back but there's there's times when I just can't stop uh, I think I my wife seems to is because she does a lot of writing as well uh, in her work um, but she's quite uh, impressed that I can knock out 2,000 words a day um, I'm not sure what's good and what you know but for me I, when I'm in a good mood it can be two to three thousand sometimes four thousand words a day and not that it's necessarily in finish and what I've found is that I'm trying to lose the fear of putting words onto paper by just getting it onto paper and then you know getting the central concept the central point the idea ideas what I'm trying to say don't worry too much about the grammar and stuff like that just get it down and then I come back and polish it up later there's another aspect that when you use memory there's obviously memory at the end of the day when you remember the walk and write it down but also yeah. memory how does m memory work when you're actually walking ie um, you remember land sites or you remember landmarks and things like that and now how that plays in terms of your experience of the walking what you remembered it to be and maybe you'll see it as something different it'll sort of break past your frequency ideas so it's a different sort of dynamic between memory yes. in participation rather than memory in writing a book kind of thing in memory of yeah I think a, a lot of it's to do with patterns and rec pattern recognition you know if you're familiar with a scene you're familiar with the seaside you're familiar with the waves lapping against a pebble shore you're familiar with those things then you start to notice the unfamiliar and I think that's uh, those things register more in the memory than um, the familiar. So um, no, it's it's an interesting question that I, I quite ask myself you know, as I'm walking along. What am I thinking about today? I don't know what I'm thinking about. I'm just actually enjoying <laughs> walking, to be honest, and and enjoying the, the silence and the nature. And uh, might disturb a buzzard, or I might be listening to the Brent geese that have just landed in you know the Thames estuary at the moment, and the way in which they talk to each other. And I'm starting to notice 
notice things about you know, which way they're facing, you know, and you start to pick up signals from the uh, the environment. And 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 I think I'm just tuning myself into rather than thinking about. Well, the you, you also get emotional memory, i.e., significant sort of things in when you're walking that come back out of your life. That's the emotional well, memory. Yeah, that, I mean, it won't be the first time that I've been in tears. You know, on a walk, I, I've lost both my parents and my younger brother during this time. And you know, I wouldn't say this is this has been a means of you know sort of coping and process but um, certain things you know do get triggered around that so um, but the emotion I mentioned the joy of walking I mean I certainly remember those points um, but it's also the um, contrast so if it's, it's sort of counterintuitive but if I've had a really wet damp night in the tent and it's been blowing a gale I've just about survived but I'll get up really early in the morning before dawn and I start walking and 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 that's really can be really pleasurable the, the fact that you've known that you've survived that night but you're also starting to walk the energy to do it and uh, you might tumble into a cafe at 10 o'clock and demolish the biggest English breakfast that you can imagine but but it, it's really really um you know if, if if you've got that contrast I'm not getting up in a comfortable house and going for a little you know you've got a contrast with a quite a difficult night and but then the joy of the morning and the sun rising and okay so uh, what about other people apart from Robert has anyone else got a question they'd like to pitch to Mark in at this stage yeah, yeah I do have a question. Uh, do you remember I just came back from a long distance walking myself a walk from England to it from my home to my home and then uh, okay, lovely. one of the things that always strike me uh, is that I always I never remember the negative thing what I mean I do remember them very well but when it's time to disca- describe what I've been experiencing it's just wonderful everything is fantastic everything's been so beautiful do you feel the same thing so for you actually the negative things become something quite relevant for your writing yeah they can i mean injury uh you know i have had to stop walking because you know blisters have just become too bad or shin splints which you're probably familiar with which is when the front part of your foreleg you know sort of like i don't ask me i'm not a medical person but that becomes very painful and i know lots of other people but Generally, I can get over those conditions after about 10 days, feet harden up, your muscles are adjusting, and then it's... What, interestingly, I've met people on on long distance walk who are desperately homesick and they really want to go home. They've had enough. And I must admit, after about three weeks, I'm kind of, you know, my wife will tease me with a picture of a curry or something like that that she's just made or and or my daughters have come back to the house and, you know. Uh, they're teasing me also, as they can do now on social media, which, by the way, I switch all of that off when I go walking. And um, but homesickness, yeah, I think sometimes that does. So that's more on the mental side, but the physical side, definitely the injury, particularly as I'm getting older, is more difficult. Um, younger, that you can recover quickly from injury. Um, but homesickness, yeah, I think that also remains. After about three weeks, I do feel, you know, I, I wouldn't mind sleeping in my own bed. Adam's put a question um, in the chat. I, I don't know. Adam, do you want to voice it or do you want us to uh, get Martin just to respond to it? Oh, no oh, okay. microphone. So, uh, okay. Well, Martin. certainly, if I, if I can, I think you will self, I haven't read if that's who you mean. Um, Robert McFarlane, definitely. Uh, I think I've read most of his works. I find that very interesting. The other uh, people that have inspired me from uh, travel writing, Paul Theroux, definitely. I think I've read most of his. Jan Morris, uh, particularly things like Pax Britannica, I think is just epic, a fantastic piece of work. Uh, Eric Newby, I think, would be another. And Nicholas Crane, who you know is like me, he's a bit you know, sort of right hemisphere type of guy. You know, he does crazy things, and I just love that. English eccentricity of somebody who comes up with the idea that he wants to walk, you know, the second degree longitude line through through England. I mean, he's, he's mad, isn't he? He's completely mad. But I just I just love that sort of stuff. So uh, some of those have influenced me. Whether or not it's it's come through in the writing, yeah, certainly I try to read as much as I can, um, you yeah, know, because certainly that I think helps improve your writing. Uh, he Did that also, answer the question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he also Adam also asked about, um, you know, is it not more interesting to get off the beaten track? You followed the beaten track. You followed the trail. Have yeah, you? Yeah, no, I, 
<laughs> I, I'd, I'd, I'd hold my hand up and say I'm guilty because I like following um, you know, finger posts and waymarks um, because I don't have to think too much about navigation. But certainly in the cycling, I've, I, I make up my own routes. I don't necessarily follow predefined routes. But I also do a lot of you know, uh, day walks and short walks, maybe overnight on the tops of mountains or something like that. Um, anyone who are writers amongst us, you know, uh, want to pitch a question about writing or... Uh... Yeah, I see uh, Danny's just put up a question as oh, well. Oh, yes, Danny, yeah. Um... Well, actually, I'd, I've never had a problem while camping in uh, Scotland or I think it's sometimes the isolation can be a bit. So, you know, I was while camping in on the Essex coast and uh, a whole squadron of geese came directly over my head and uh, the noise it made uh, frightened the living daylights. Out. But they were just settling in the lake uh, opposite. So I think, you know, being exposed to nature in that way, owls and badgers and things like that can be you have to get a bit, um, you have to get used to that, um, but it's also thrilling. Uh, but I've never had any problems, you know, sort of while camping, uh, as long as I think there's a skill to doing it. In Scotland, it's perfectly legal. In the England, it's everything is, should be owned by private land, but you have to be a little bit more cunning uh, to, to get away with it. Although it seems more and more people are doing it, particularly in the Lake District. Um, things that you know they yeah you know, they they don't seek permission they seek forgiveness uh, D danny one of the questions would be do you think it's harder for women to to wild camp than it is for men i mean i don't know or anyone else who in the in 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 the meeting feel that is that uh was that the well, what, I, what i must say in terms of long distance walkers i think on balance i meet as many if not more single women walking than I meet single men. That's quite telling. Uh, but what I was just going to pitch in a work, sort of another question, which was about, um, and you partly answered it, which is, I think, um, uh, is is about what are the um, uh, the good encounters that you've had and what are the ones that you either plan to avoid or, 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 or you know, I mean, uh, uh, Andreas or, uh, mentioned this a little bit when saying you only remember the good bits or at least even the bad bits you interpret as good bits where, on reflection. But uh, when it comes to sort of encounters on the trail, where, which are the ones that you remember most and would like to have again? And which are the ones that you, <laughs> you plan to avoid? Encounters. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing that's ever made me frightened or concerned for my safety you know, in talking about hierarchy of needs. The miserableness of, you know, getting soaking wet for days on end, well, that's my own fault for not taking care of myself. What I do find is that I'm becoming a little bit complacent with planning, and I'm always kicking myself because I should have been doing more planning. Um, and I just get too casual about it because I, I feel as if, you know, things always work out in the end, but sometimes they don't, so I get a bit annoyed. But I don't think there's anything particularly negative that uh, the experience just, you know, I don't think there's there's never been anything that's been particularly negative. Mm, okay, well, that's great. Um, uh, Liz Nicholas, uh, Liz, do you want to ask the question yourself? or? Uh, yeah, or she's asked, you know, do, is she going to? Uh... Yes, I just wondered if you always walked alone um, and what that did to your psyche if you're going away for these very long kind of four or five weeks? Well, I'm an introvert, so I'm quite happy with my own company. Um, I do set out to walk alone, but I do occasionally meet people that I might spend a couple of days walking with, and that's always good fun. And sometimes we may break apart and meet again, you know, on the same trail and resynchronize, so to speak. So, but I do meet quite a few people, and I like walking alone because I think uh, I, I'm more approachable. Um, from other people, you know, there's a sort of certain vulnerability of somebody walking on their own, and therefore you meet more people. And I find the interactions with people are much better than I would be if I was walking with a, yeah, you know, with a colleague or with somebody else. Yeah, that's interesting that it opens you up to other conversations. Yeah, is it Anne's the question as well? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Anne, do you want to speak, or are you uh, someone else who's not got a microphone? <laughs> No, no, no luck with the uh, talking. Well, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't walk the Wild Atlantic Way. I cycled it. I'm not sure if I would recommend it as a cycle route. Actually, parts of it certainly, but yeah, you know, some of the roads in Ireland tend to be a bit narrow and a bit fast. 
but I managed to get around those, uh, generally speaking. Uh, somebody mentioned that there were national trails in Ireland the other day. But what I what I would really like to see is um, is for a national trail to be funded in Northern Ireland. Um, but I understand there are national trails in Ireland, and I don't know much about those. But I I would be interested in that, and I know that. There are some superb you know, mountain walking. I have done some walking in Donegal historically. I used to um, I used to work in Limavady for uh, a few months, and there was a colleague there, and we went. We did quite a few walks uh, actually in the 90s uh, in Donegal and Sligo. Um, and there's certainly a lot more which I'd like to do. I think if I was to go, you know. Um, into Europe, so to speak, that I think Ireland would be somewhere where I have to look first. Right, well, I, I think I can answer that for you, Martin, because I interviewed a couple who walked all 42 national trails in Ireland. So uh, I know there are 42, <laughs> but uh, um, beyond that, I can't tell you where, where, yeah. how they're divided up, whether they're north or south of the border, but I think they're you know, right across Ireland. Yeah, no, I need to find out more about that. Okay, um, well, yeah, Adam's written one about night walking. Yeah, yes, please. Do, yeah. yeah, I do do that, and <laughs> it's it. I can utterly understand how it it changes. I, I don't know what what is phenomenology. Oh, phenomenology. Yeah, phenomenology. Uh, where it's uh, uh, interpreting a space through the body, embodiment, and the senses. So using your senses to interpret a place. There are times when uh, yeah, I get up at stupid o'clock. And yeah, say two o'clock in the morning, and I just walk out to the dawn, which might be at seven o'clock. I do five hours at night with a head torch until the batteries run out. It's great. It's fantastic. It, you know, as long as you're happy about your your placing your feet, but your eyes do adjust. But um, there's so much that goes on at night, and certainly the stars and shooting stars, and all these sorts of things, and the bird life, uh, you know, is is quite different. Uh, as I quite enjoy. Yeah, you know, sometimes if I'm restless at night and I'm in a tent and I'm wild camping and I'm, or it's raining, I just get up and start walking. Well, that's brilliant. Well, Martin, I think it's time that we 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 give um, people a chance of winning a copy of your book, don't you? Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. So what we what we've done is, um, uh, oh, Robert, you've come in with a late a, a late question. Um, anecdotes. Well, <laughs> bird anecdotes. Yes, I do actually, and it was quite a recent one, and I'd, I found it very thrilling. Is that I was walking a section of the Essex Coast Path, and a, a relationship developed, let's say, with a, with a with a um, kestrel. So the kestrel was landing on a post uh, about ten meters in front of me, and then when I was about well, sorry, when I was about twenty meters, and when I got to about ten meters, it would take off and it would go down and it would settle in the grass about 20 meters and 10 meters it would take off and i thought well this was just you know initially i thought it was just being scared you know and it would fly away but it didn't and they repeated that pattern for about a mile and i wondered whether or not there was a relationship that, that i was doing something to the ground to disturb mice or worms or something which you know so it learned there was a learn hunting technique there, but, um, and I was very interested in that, but it, it was certainly of such a repeatable pattern that it, there was some you know, sort of symbiotic relationship that, that was going on between me walking and the, and the bird hunting. And okay, well, that's great. Okay, so we're running out of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set these questions to you. So what, what you have to do is you just have to write down, um, uh, they're multiple choice, um, and um, uh, and just write them down um, the answers um, if you've got a pen and paper, and then add them to the chat at the end. And um, hopefully, um, it's just a bit of fun, um, and it's not really a test of what you've been listening to, but we'll see. So the first question we're going to try is how many national trails are to be found in England? So A twelve, uh, B nine. C7 uh, or D4. So, how many national trails to be found in England? Uh, A12, B9, C7 or D4. So, that's the first one. The second is there are two trails in the UK that are ranked in the top 10 most valuable to archaeologists. Which two might they be? 
A, Hadrian's Wall and the Southwest Coast Path, B, the Ridgeway and the Pennine Way, C, Offers Dyke and the South Downs Way, and D, Offers Dyke and the Hadrian's Wall Path. I'm going to put that because that's quite a complicated one. I'll pop that in the chat so that uh, everyone has a chance to read that. So I think it's quite a tough to remember. So let me just put that in the chat. So, uh, OK, so there are two trails in the UK that are ranked to the top 10 most valuable to archaeologists. A, Hadrian's Wall Path, Southwest Coast Path. B, the Ridgeway and the Pennine Way. C, Offers Dyke Path and the South Downs Way. Or Offers Dyke Path and Hadrian's Wall Path. The third question, OK, is which was the first and which the most recent trail to be added to the portfolio of England's national trails? Now, this is a, a question testing your listening because Martin has actually answered this for you. Uh, but I'll pop those in uh, chat as well and uh, see whether you can work those ones out. OK, so um, they are which was the first and which is the most recent? A, the Pennine Way, the oldest, and the Cotswolds Way, the most recent. B, Hadrian's Wall and the Southwest Coast Path, the Thames Path and Hadrian's Wall Path, uh, or the Pennine Way and England's Coast Path. So, uh, you know, it's, have a guess at it. If you don't know the answer, it's not. Uh, we're not going to hold it against you. And there are two more. And these ones are a little simpler, I hope, anyway. On which of the, these trails do you not need to cross an estuary at low tide? OK, so um, on which of these trails do you need not need to cross an estuary? OK, so you can walk this route without crossing. You don't have to cross an estuary. So that's the Pedders Way and North Norfolk Coast Path, the Pembrokeshire Coast Path, the South West Coast Path, or the England Coast Path. So just write down just quickly A, B, C, or D. Have a punt for it and see. And the final one is the symbol for the Camino Santiago and other Caminos is the scallop shell. For a national trail in England, is it A, the thistle, B, the lion, C, acorn, or D, fir tree? So the only one I didn't put up there was the first one. So um, if I put the first one up there and give that to you again. So the first one was how many national trails would be found in England? OK, so the first one is how many national trails would be found in England? And then uh, the second one, there are two trails in the UK that are ranked in the top 10. And which was the first and which the most recent trail to be added to the portfolio of England's national trails? And on which of these trails do you need to cross an estuary on foot at low tide? OK, so write in your answers. Robert's got straight in. He's um, fired away. I'm assuming that your, your first letter is A there, not 12. But um, anyone else going for this or Robert going to pick up two copies? So have a punt. Just type in the chat whatever you want in terms of numbers. Letters. Anyone else? We wait for another two or three minutes. Anyone finally have one more go? Hasn't done it yet. I'm glad you're doing this, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the right answers are let's see, I don't know anyone who's out there who's got it. A, D, D, A, C. A, D, D, A, C. Anyone got Oh, Liz Nicholas yeah. has got it. Um, Ooh, um, oh. and, oh. and Anne. So Liz and Anne are in. So there you are. So Liz and Anne, you're, you're the winners of e uh, copy by Martin Howe. So I'll make sure I'll send those to you. So thanks everyone and uh, for coming along. We um, have uh, another uh, guest author in November, on the 16th of November. And interesting enough, Martin mentioned that he wants to walk to the uh, Cape Roth, the Cape Roth Trail, and uh, we've actually got Alex Roddy coming in to the sound. Yeah, he's going to, uh, uh, vertebra, yeah. yeah, and he's uh, he's going to do uh, uh, be talking about his walk uh, to the Cape Roth Trail, as it's called. The Cape Roth is right up in the northeast, uh, sorry, northwest corner of Scotland. What um what what his book is more about actually is trying to get away from using uh, social media and getting That's away. Different. He's trying to get away from digital. It's a sort of digital detox for Alex Roddy. But that's on the 16th of November. So just once more, Martin, thank you very much for coming into the, our first salon. And um, good luck with all your walking and writing. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe if I can just put something in as well. I'm, I'm also at Stanford's in London on the 23rd of November, and um, I'll be Person. giving a talk, talk in there. The yeah. Yep. 
in the flesh. So, um, and we'll actually be uh, giving a talk, you know, the usual events that they run. You know, I'm delighted because Stanford says just, you know, my, been obsessed with that place since I can ever remember, but actually giving a talk there is going to be amazing. But no, I've really enjoyed uh, talking to you all. And yeah, if there's any further questions anybody would like, I'm sure you can find me on social media and uh, you know, either through my website, uh, Trail Planner, which is just my blog site, you can contact me through that. And um, But you know, if you do read my book, I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, I'm always interested in, 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 in reviews in whatever media uh, is available. Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks everybody. And uh, we yeah. hope to see you next time. Uh, next week, we have a Hungarian uh, sound artist, uh, David Babak. Can you pronounce his name? Solomo? David Somlo. <laughs> David Somlo. It's got to so, um, uh, check him out that he's, he's coming in in two weeks time into the cafe um, otherwise uh, hope to see you uh, again at either a cafe or a salon and thanks once again Martin it's my pleasure keep writing keep walking everyone absolutely bye for now